we're going to get going. Everybody, thanks for coming. Today, we have Mike Baird uh, and Jeff Brelio on. Um, Mike Baird, I have known for, man, probably 15, 18 years. You guys all know Mike. I posted a link to his Facebook. He's running an awesome group called the Smarter Real Estate Tribe. I'm repping his shirt today. Being, I'm a part of his tribe and it's added a ton of value to my life. And I know a lot of value to everyone else in here as well that's a part of it. Um, I'll let Mike kind of give a brief introduction to him. And then Jeff Brelio. Jeff Brelio is an attorney. He is, uh, he's an active investor. He, uh, you know, and I'll let him introduce himself as well. But Jeff's a great example to me of, of someone that is in it for the long haul. He's always providing value. He's always at the different functions and at the different meetings and RIAs and giving of his time. He's been a marathon runner. So I know he's in this for the long haul. He's slow and steady and he's, uh, he's going to get set a good pace for everybody. So a couple of quick thoughts I had to start. So I kind of named this, I was thinking about this last night. The sun will come up tomorrow. As you guys have all probably seen, you know, everything's changing day to day, right? And, and week to week. And I thought back to in high school, I had a really good friend of mine, Matt Alba. And I haven't experienced a lot of, you know, I guess death or tragedy in my life. But when we were in high school, um, his his mom passed away from cancer and him and his brother and sisters, they were, you know, they, they were all in high school or junior high and it was, you know, super tragic time. And, and I hadn't experienced a lot with funerals or whatever. And, and, and I remember Matt's brother, Brian, you know, he got up there and talked and he told a story about how the day before the night before his mom passed away, you know, she told him, she said, listen, you know, Brian, and, and I may be getting this a little bit out of order or not exactly correct, but the point is this, that he said, she said, Brian, I want you to just remember, you know, after I pass away and, and you know, you're going to wake up the next day and the sun will come out tomorrow, right? So I know a lot of people are anxious and nervous and, and not quite sure what to do right now, but, you know, that, that kind of hit me and I remembered that thinking, you know what, no matter what happens, the sun's going to come out tomorrow. We're all going to be all right. So, so hopefully this call will, will reinforce some of that and we'll get some good ideas and know how to navigate, you know, specifically as it relates to real estate. So really quick, Mike, just, I kind of gave you a brief intro and then I'm gonna have Jeff do the same. Give us, you know, your quick 30 second, a minute elevator speech about what you do, where you're coming from and what you're all about. Sure. I mean, first of all, I, I'm really here because I want to learn from you, Matt, and I want to learn from Jeff. Like when you invited me, I was like, dude, I'm, I must be in the right. They say, you know, Josh Zaglowski, who's in the tribes, always like, you know, you're in the right room when you're the the, 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 the dumbest guy around. So I, I feel like I'm probably in, in the right room and in good company today. So um, I love that about the sun will come out tomorrow. I think it's totally true, Jeff. I really I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Um, so I started flipping in 2002. I was in college and I was getting a bunch of stuff. And I, I went in my college professor was the guy that actually told me not to invest in real estate. He was a real estate professor. I went into his office. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go flip real estate. He's like, I wouldn't do it. It's too risky. I thought to myself, hey, if I can do it in today's market and 2002 wasn't exactly super strong, I says, hey, I'm going to be able to make this work. So I was a construction guy for the first four to five years. I wasn't smart enough to go out and get a bunch of teams together and do all that. I started doing just construction rehabs. I bought a really, you know, turded up type of a property out there in Magna and made a little bit of money on that one and just continued to build my business. And, um, you know, we had, I've done around, I don't, I don't know how many it is, lots of transactions. It's been a lot of fun. Um, kind of went through the whole crap thing i did an opportunity to do a tv show on men called spike which was your flip men on spike it was cool but the reality of it is i i love the business of real estate that's what i'm passionate about and i'm passionate about helping other folks try to figure this thing out it's blessed my life and my family as it has jeff i'm sure it has yours matt i know that it has yours as well and that's what I just, I love to do. I love to just kind of share the story. And um, here we are in another kind of chapter, if you will, and um, just looking to provide some sort of piece of content. And I tell people, hey, if you're on one of these calls, if you can walk away with just one or two things that you can actually implement, because we, you hear a lot of stuff being spewed, right? 
and you take a lot of notes, but I would invite you at the end of this call, if there's one piece of gold that Jeff drops, star it, circle it, and implement it, and everything else can be noise, right? So just walk away from this call, and Matt, props to you for putting it on, but walk away from this call with one thing that can truly be implemented, like today and tomorrow and into the future, and you'll be well served by that. So kind of through this call, and as I'm thinking through this, that's the nut I'm looking for. I'm looking for that one golden thing that I can say, I miss that, Jeff, or I miss that matter. I'll watch this chat, and what what's coming out in this chat, and what am I going to basically learn and grow from? So I'm just excited to be here and um, happy to serve any way I can. So, yeah. Awesome. All right, Jeff, give us your quick little intro. <laughs> yeah, my name is Jeff Braleo. I've been in real estate since 1999 uh, when I picked up my first flip projects. Um, I've actually told the story a little bit. In 99 to sort of 2000, 2001, we had another recession. And I was doing flips during a time of 0% appreciation. Uh, so I kind of cut my teeth on really, really thin margins. Um, and then, I've, you know, since then I've been a real estate investment attorney where we focus on here at the law office on providing the things that real estate investors need from their asset protection uh, to help with transactions. So my focus really is on helping to protect my clients and keep them out of trouble. Uh, for the last 10 to 15 years, I've also been a real estate educator, uh, really trying to just give the knowledge uh, that I've accumulated over the years, you know, as an attorney, I was eight years as a real estate agent. I'm an escrow officer. I'm a private lender. I've done flips. I've done rentals. I've done residential. I've done commercial. Um, so I've, I see transactions from multiple angles. So I kind of, I, f I fill in where a lot of real estate educators like Mike and you, they kind of get into the nitty gritties of, you know, how to be a landlord, how to do flips, how to work with contractors, how to um, you know, reduce costs. And I come in really on a transactional level um, and help clients with tough transactions and kind of get from A to B as safely as possible. Um, and just to really, really love teaching. I'm a teacher by nature. I taught in secondary ed. I taught in higher ed um, and just love teaching. And the more I can get the word out, the, the happier I am. Awesome. This is great. So we're going to dive right into what I think is uh, uh, something that's happening frequently, unfortunately, these last three or four days. And that is deals falling through because of this knee jerk reaction of like what's going on, right? I've experienced it myself with stuff I'm selling, with stuff I'm funding for borrowers, where people are just getting nervous and they're, they're, they're bailing on their deal. So I don't know if there's one right answer for all of this, but, but Jeff and Mike, I want to hear your thoughts. Um, Jeff, maybe specifically, there's, there's the letter of the law and then maybe the spirit, right? Like there's all sorts of things the contract you could do to enforce something. But my question is, is, is now the right time to really be doing that? Or what are some other strategies we can be doing um, to maybe try and rework contracts, save deals, keep people still moving down the path of, of wanting to complete the transaction. Um, so we'll go, we'll go back to Mike, Jeff, while you're thinking about it, since uh, Mike, give us your thoughts on that. I don't know if you have a specific example or maybe what your strategy or recommendation to people would be, whether you are the buyer or the seller right now and people getting cold feet, wanting to bail, wanting to get out of their contract. Well, I, I, I think it's a great question. I'm, first of all, I think that here's the story. Last couple of weeks, I've been out with um, some buyers, right? And everyone knows that's been out with buyers recently in the last month or so has recognized that the fundamentals have just been lost. They were they were thrown out. I mean, you go through the market in two days, three days, one day, zero days, multiple offers, gone, gone, gone have my client turn to me and they'd be like, Mike, is this a good deal? And I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not a great buyer's, you know, if you're working with me and you want me to help you find a house, I'm not the great buyer's agent because I'm going to tell you to walk away from majority of these deals, you know, I'm, I think, um, and so I'm never going to be on the top, the top selling agent that's out there. Um, so fundamentals over the last little bit have in some regards, Price per square foot, who knows what? Let's just pay it. Let's just, let's ask, you know, multiple offer. Let's put an escalation clause in there. I really think that 
this is an opportunity for us to, you know, have a real kind of moment of conversation with some of the clients and say, what's prudent, what's not, does it meet your needs? Yes or no. And does it fit your, your financial profile right now? And I, I, I don't have a problem, frankly, saying, let's look at that profile and let's be real about what it is and whether this is going to work for you long-term. I think serving the client is the best thing. I think on the same side, on the deals that we're in, there's going to be, there's some investors right now that are in deals they should not frankly be in, or they're under contract on deals they shouldn't frankly be in. I mean, you, I, I, I preach this stuff when I say, look, I want to be in a transaction 90 to 120 days. I want to be in a bread and butter type, um, type market where I'm under, underneath that medium price point. I don't want to be in deals where I'm, I'm nine to you know 18 months out on type stuff. I don't typically like to be in the high end type stuff. So this is an opportunity for us to clean up the portfolio a little bit on on that buy side for us too. So I'm 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 one of con being conservative and being prudent. I'm also not one of saying, hey guys, the sky is falling. We've heard the number of fifty five thousand single family home shortage here. We have some really great fundamentals as it relates to general employment, interest rate environment still low. So again, I'm not telling folks, hey, you got to sell like this is fire sell. This is crazy. I'm saying let, let's look at the situation. Let's look at the house. You have significant down. Yes or no. What's the equity play on this? I mean, I think we got to take it as a really deal by deal basis because that's how we serve clients best. Matt, I am very, very fired up when people start putting really big, broad strokes across markets and across scenarios. Yeah. Like, I really want to dig in and hit the individual on that basis and say, what, what does this look like for you six months from now with scenario A, B, and C? And again, if there's deals that, you know, I'm in one right now, I haven't, um, you, you saw that property up on Capitol Hill. We bought that one for yep. 940. We recently closed at 135. I just went under contract with the next door neighbors at 800,000. That's a $200,000 remodel. I'd be into that a mill with one. I think that one's a one, two house. This house is causing me opportunity to pause. And hopefully if you're out there with that type of inventory, you would just think about it a second time. It's we're not, you know, we don't have that bullish attitude anymore that, that we should. So I don't know, hopefully that, that provides a little yeah. perspective. No, that does. And I think Jeff will, will uh, complete the loop maybe from his, his legal mind side of it. And before I go to Jeff, one of my notes that I wanted to accomplish today, I think we'll piggyback off of right of what you said, Mike, and that is, Situation by situation, case by case, like what might make sense for one investor is not going to make the same sense for another investor. So let's take you have, you know, 20 flips going on right now, right? And you have a ton of rehab money out and you're always in that mode of buy, buy, buy. You got to look at a new opportunity, a lot different than a guy that maybe says has cash, can do the work himself, and he doesn't have any deals going on right now. Right? right. So be careful who you listen to and everybody's got different motivations and take to heart, like even what we're talking about here and apply it to your specific situation. Right. Because everybody is going to be different. And, and Mike's points about the base hits, the medium price point, you know, being realistic with where you're at. I think that's all great. So, so Jeff, maybe attack this from an angle of people have probably contacted you saying, Hey, this guy had 10 grand non-refundable. Maybe it's a wholesaler, right? Saying this guy had 10 grand non-refundable. Now he's not going to want to perform. What advice, if any, would you give them given today's situation? Not a month ago, right? But like right. today's right. situation. A um, couple of thoughts first. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of four categories to speak generally. There's, you know, hey, I've got current rental property with tenants in them. I'm thinking about maybe picking up new rental properties. I've got current flips that I'm working on now, or do I pick up new flips kind of, kind of in the future? I think what's really going to have to happen is it, the, we've been gifted with a pr very high appreciation rates, which allowed many investors particularly to sort of slide by without really good deal analysis. I think deal analysis is going to be probably the hottest teaching topic for the next couple of weeks to months, simply because your deals have to be better. 
your, your deals have to be stronger. Um, and so when you're, if you, if you're in a deal now, uh, let's say you're under contract and you're picking up a deal from a wholesaler and now the numbers aren't looking good. And I think when you run the numbers, you need to run run numbers for a number of scenarios. Um, you know, your normal goal is to flip a house in six months, right? You, you've been doing that over and over and over again. You're going to plan for maybe nine to 12 months now on the retail market. If that market slows down and, and calculate your hard money costs at a much and hold costs a much longer time period. Right. And so if you start analyzing the deals differently, given the different economic situations and say, okay, what's my deal going to look like if I can, you know, hit it like I always hit it. What is it going to look like if I have to hold it three months longer? What are my options if I can't retail it out? Um, so if you're a flipper, and there's been so many flippers in the last few years because of the market, a lot of the flippers aren't caught up to speed on buy and hold and ways to hold properties. So they don't know about seller financing deals or, or whether or not they can even uh, secure a loan for long-term financing. And you just gotta start to think about those other options as plan C and plan D. Most investors don't have anything beyond plan A because plan A has always worked. For the last five, six years, the simple standard plan that every real estate coach teaches, you know, of take off 10% for this, take off 10% of this. If you got this profit margin, go ahead and do it. The profit margin is gonna be a lot thinner. So you've just got to run better numbers and better analysis and come up with alternative plans if your first option doesn't work. In 2000, I was picking up flips thinking, great, had a decent profit margin. There was zero appreciation in the market, but I still had a built-in profit for my flip. I couldn't flip it and make more than five or $10,000. I actually turned my flips into rental properties for two years while I got some natural appreciation, some pay down on, and I had some, I was able to get some long-term financing. So I just turned them into rentals and then after two years sold the rentals. It also lowered my, my tax rate because they became long-term holes instead of a short-term flip. And that helped pad my numbers that I wasn't getting elsewhere. So I think step number one is just a stronger deal analysis, coming up with alternative solutions and alternative scenarios and making sure you're, you're prepared for any of those eventualities. The, the scariest thing in real estate is not having options, right? Not understanding what else you can do. So seek out, there are, there are so many, we're lucky here in Utah, there's a lot of investors who can come up with 10 different solutions for any given property, right? You may not know the solution, but I guarantee you there are people out there who will have other solutions for you, okay? Step number one, so if you're under contract, and the wholesalers, and I love my wholesalers, um, but the wholesalers have been, you gotta remember that on any deal, once a price is locked under contract, the profit margin is then fixed because you've got a purchase price, you've got an ARV. And what wholesalers have been doing is, is splitting that profit margin with the flippers. And the wholesalers have had pretty huge margins. Um, those margins are going to have to come down. The wholesalers are just not because there's not as big a spread. And if they're going to induce the flippers to actually get in and remodel and, and make money on, on the risky side of the flip, the wholesalers are going to have to understand that they're not going to get the wholesale fees that they used to get. Um, if you're under contract right now and there's a, you've got a huge down payment, like a, a non-refundable fee with a wholesaler, I would absolutely work with that wholesaler. The wholesaler can still most likely, depending on the timing, I would work with them, you know, possibly uh, get out of that contract if they're still in their due diligence phase, yeah. right? And I think wholesalers should be flexible and uh, amenable to the actual market and if wholesalers start, you know, forcing and, and, and holding on to these non-refundable fees, um, that's going to hurt a lot of flippers and flippers are their customers. So you have to, you know, remember who your customer is and make sure you're working to keep them in the pipeline. Does that make awesome. sense? Yeah, that does. And, and I'm noticing on the chat guys like Luke and Clay and Dane, if you want to chime in as wholesalers, um, they're, they're kind of applauding what you're saying, right? Right. Great info. You know, wholesalers might need to be a little flexible, always work on your right. exit strategies and, and I've been flexible in my private lending. Yes. Um, because if I start going, no, you're late, I'm, I'm adding on the fees. It's just making it more difficult for them, which is going to push them into riskier territory, which puts me at greater risk. 
right? There's a, our market is very interconnected. Uh, the lenders, the wholesalers, the flippers, the buy and hold people, we're all kind of working together. If we start sort of being territorial, it's going to affect everybody and the, and the industry. Yeah. Um, so we need to understand that we are kind of all need to help each other through this and we'll make it out. I guarantee it. <laughs> we're yeah, yeah, going to yeah. all come out ahead um, if we're smart. Um, if you've got a flip project going on now, keep, keep going at it. You know, don't, don't say, no, don't stop midway through a flip. Yeah, right? get, it, get it done, get it on the market. There are still buyers, and I think the buyers will come back. You know, most economic downturns, we get some preparation for it. It's usually three to six months before it really hits the public, and the public gets the panic of a recession. Because this started with a health crisis, the panic, the panic has already set in. Right. So the public is already aware of that. But as the health crisis clears out and people get back to work and stuff, then we'll have a better idea of how to assess the actual economic uh, effects. Uh, but we won't know that for another month, awesome. maybe two months. Those are great thoughts. And people chiming in on the chat are agreeing with that. So I appreciate our wholesalers uh, pitching in, Dane Clay and Luke. Luke from Texas. If I missed anyone, I apologize. But um, Luke, we uh, here in Utah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Luke's from Utah, right, right, right. So, okay, okay. So we're gonna move. We, we, uh, man, we could cover all of these as a three-day seminar, right? Oh, so we're just hitting on the 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 high level to kind of give some quick tips and tricks. And and as a reminder for what Mike said, be thinking about that one thing, one thing you can do today to put into action to make a difference. And and I would even you know expand on that to say. What's the one thing you could do for your business? What's the one thing you could do today for your neighbor, for your family? family. Don't think of a hundred things. Just think of one thing, right? And, and do that one thing every day and it'll compound, compound. And then, you know, over the course of a month, you've done 30 awesome things, right? So uh, before the next question, uh, Gay and uh, Dave Lloyd asked me to explain why I call this keeping the dream alive. <laughs> so <laughs> I just had fun with it. When I was in high school, when we were all graduating, it was kind of like this thing of like, we got to keep this dream alive, right? Keep the dream alive of having fun, being bros, you know? So I, I kind of thought we need to keep the dream alive of, of, you know, and the sun will come up tomorrow. Like, this is just a process. We got to lean into it. It's going to look a little different for a little bit, but the dream's still there. We're all going to be great. We might get some bumps and bruises, but you know what? We're all going to come out of this okay. So, so that's kind of why we're calling it keep the dream alive. Um, man, doing that, I forgot about my next question, but, um, <laughs> Matt, while you're thinking yeah, about that, yeah. I have three things circled from Jeff that cool. I love. Let's Remember the customer. That's huge. Have a secondary strategy plan. Like I mentioned this deal, I'm under contract right now at 800 grand moving for, you know, one, two, one, three. It, it, this doesn't potentially have a great second strategy right? So that's what's causing you opportunity for pause. So it's first one, remember the customer, have a second strategy, and then hone in on value. The single most important skill I've learned over the years is understanding value and understanding those effects on the value. And I mean, we all know, we just got to dial in rehab. What is it? Hold time. What is it? He bumped it a little bit. That's strong. You know, rather than four, it might be six. It might be eight. Who knows? Build it in. Profit margins will get tighter. So th those are my three right now. And I got to narrow it down to one, but I love all three, but that's what jumped out at me. Awesome. I remember my, the, the first lesson I learned from my first coach over 20 years ago was there's always another deal. Yep. You know, we, we've talked about, you know, in good we talk about this all the time, but in good times and appreciating times, people don't listen to it is that don't fit the deal to, to make your numbers work. The deal works or doesn't work on its own. Right. And when you start twisting things to make it work for you, you're headed down a very bad road, right? Analyze the deal, keep the numbers legit, really understand value, that's so important. Really learn how to make do comps, don't rely on other people's comps, um, and understand your own financial abilities. Right. Great. Yeah. I love that. I always tell people the story of, you know, it's like you're running for a bus stop and, and you think like that's the only bus that's coming along. Right. And you miss the bus, but it's like, you know what, just wait a second. Another bus is coming, right? Another deal's coming. Another opportunity is coming. 
Um, I got this question last night. Maybe this is a good transition since Mike and Jeff, I know you also both do uh, private hard money lending. So I had a call last night from a, a borrower, a guy you would all know, I'm not going to say his name, but, but he was very legitimately concerned that he's three fourths of the way done on some flips. He's coming up on his six month mark with his hard money loan. And, you know, I think, you know, they're, they're, the panic for him sets in going, is my hard money lender going to foreclose on me? Right? Like, am I going to get this taken out right out, out from underneath me? So, um, Mike, let's speak to that for a minute. You've been in that shoe a lot. You've also been a borrower just like me, right? What, what advice would you have from both sides, being the borrower and maybe the lender, of how you might help navigate that conversation with a flipper that's stressed out, that's just worried, like, what is going to happen? Here's my first thought is I think open communication is more important now than ever before in the past. Yes. Um, you would have communication up front and then communication on the end. And that's about it. By the way, where's my payoff? Where's my money? Right. Yep. Lenders want to be communicated to. They want to feel like they have are well securitized. Their collateral is right. That. Um, they show up, you know, I, I had a lender, I showed up the other day to a property and this, the, the super big gulp that was sitting on the front porch was there in the same exact spot for the last three and a half weeks. That's a problem, right? Yeah. Get the super big gulp out of there and everything else is the same, right? Nothing's moved. Like lenders want to be communicated to here's what's happening with our projects. Here's what's moving forward with them. Here are the steps, here are our numbers and lenders are going to want to work with you and make sure that that, that that transaction happens. Right. Yep. So I think open communication across all of what I refer to as these key information hubs, a transaction coordinator is a key information hub. They have access to a lot of files. Lenders are key information hubs. They have information to a lot of files, what's going on. Title companies, same exact thing. These are information type hubs that I'm contact and are familiar with a lot of transactions, right? So I think that being in contact with our private money lenders as to what our portfolio is doing, we're finding liquidity, what our challenges are, and all that kind of thing are going to be key. Because, yeah, I get it. When you have a lot of money, you're thinking the same thing. I got a lot of money out there right now. What are What's happening with my assets? And the key thing is, is I want to know that these borrowers are moving forward with the securitization of that particular asset. So communicate that and communicate the issues that are being had too is, hey, here's, you know, here's where we're at. But we, 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 if we've ever had a sense of urgency as it relates to uh, a portfolio of flips right now, like it's time to kick up the urgency, right? Yeah. I think a, nothing will, nothing will irritate a lender more with, a lack of communication, no urgency, and a poor plan for execution. It, it, it sickens me that properties are sitting and they're yes. not getting done. I would also say this, if in, in the past, a deal would come to a lender, a lender would underwrite usually that deal. I think what lenders are going to start doing more of now is not just understanding that specific deal, but they're going to look at that lender as a whole and want to know a little bit more as to what that portfolio is doing and what other debt and leverage is out there. Because I'm telling you, money tends, unfortunately, tends to sometimes trickle and get commingled into one asset to another to get this one around the monopoly board. And then this one's got to get and da, da, da. And if as me as a lender and the other smart lenders out there, they're going to look at an individual piece of collateral, but they're good. They, they would want to look at that portfolio and look at the leverage across the board and what money's there. I think that's just smart. Okay. Super awesome. Really quick. And then we'll go to Jeff. You are the borrower. It's your flip. You're stressed out maybe you have the resources or not to finish the house. So you just gave advice from the lender's point of view. Now you're in the borrower's shoes and you may or may not have the confidence or the resources that, that you feel like you should. Okay. So this is something that hit me not long ago. It was a bit of a, an epiphany for me. Hopefully you can follow. But I always ask the investors are really what they're asking is they're 
asking themselves and they're scared because they're saying my next money, everyone's looking for their next money. They're quick as cash. Okay. And everyone's looking at their portfolio and they're saying, well, this one's under contract. So I'm two weeks out on that one. So that may be my closest money or I'm, I'm, I'm rehabbing this one and that one's 30 to 45 days out or 60 days out and that's my closest money. My answer to that is this, your closest money may be the deal you don't have. That's it. It may be the deal you find today. It's what Jeff just said a moment ago, another day, another deal. So who's to say your next dollars in isn't the deal that I find today at two o'clock? right? That I somehow wholesale or I negotiate or whatever. So don't be just sitting back and looking at your portfolio right now. Yeah, we got to take care of business. We're going to take care of home and we're going to manage that asset. Like that, that's what we do. We take care of business. But I also want to say, look, the net, your next cash, you might be looking crap. Like my next cash might be 90 days out. That's garbage. Your next cash is the deal you find today, Mm -hmm. tomorrow, the next day. You know, and I know it's hard to say, like, I don't know that I want to be spending right now. You know, I've, you've heard me say it. I never stop shopping. I'm always shopping, you yeah. know? And so I would find trust in that. Get your mojo back rather than thinking, hey, man, I'm, I, I don't have any money coming in for 60, 90 days. What am I going to do? You communicate with the lender. You put a plan together on that current portfolio and you go hunting for that. Like you're good enough for that. Go dig down and make that next cash dollar come like soon. Like I want that in the next 10 days, next five days, next seven days. Why not? So that, that, that's my thought is your next dollar, your next, your next money may not be in the portfolio you're holding right now. That's how hungry and that's the urgency I would bring to the table. Okay. Awesome. Jeff, your thoughts. Um, On the lender side. Yeah. Let me just, no lender wants to foreclose on you. We don't, we don't want to do that. I don't want an REO. I don't want to manage. I don't want to finish. That's it's not how I want to spend my time. So we don't want to foreclose. And you, you, and I'll just say, amen, amen, amen to communicating with your lender. That is everything to a lender. Yeah. And your lender may have contacts that you don't have. They may have exit strategies that you haven't thought of. Um, and they may have resources that you can take advantage of because I want you to succeed because that gets me my money back, <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right? So it's, it is about a win-win situation. So the more I can do to help you, um, I will, because that, just is, that makes me safer. Um, so reach out to people, um, and your lenders may be a good first source of those other resources. Perfect. And then on the, the, the buyer side, yes, I think keep moving forward. Don't, don't stop, don't shut down. That's, that is something you don't want to do you're just going to be analyzing things differently and you're just going to have other exit strategies and have other plans in place to cover all eventualities. So it's not a matter of stopping. It's just a matter of planning and reevaluating given the current market conditions. Awesome. And Sterling Harris just chimed in to uh, give another amen to all of this is uh, don't slow down. We're just going to redirect and reallocate. Right? So one Maybe I'll go with some of the questions that have come up in the chat because that's maybe what most people want to hear is, um, man, that was all good. Man, Mike, Jeff, that was awesome. Um, John Prince even said he's feeling the Holy Ghost after listening to Mike. So, Mike, you're doing something right, man. Keep it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Comps, this is, uh, this is an interesting question. Drilling down on the skills, evaluating properties, doing, you know, d- drilling down on your numbers, you know, uh, a little bit better than you normally would. How are you going to be looking at comparables? You got a deal today, Mike. You're analyzing it for a flip. What comps are you going to be looking at knowing you can't predict the future? Are you going to be looking at comps from the last three months or maybe from a year ago or two years ago? How are you trying to figure out now today what that ARV is going to be like in six to eight months? Well, for, it's a good question. First thing I'm doing is I'm actually going to start looking at comps, right? There's Because there's a lot of people out there that even just quit, quit looking at comps, right? They just, and I, I'm a huge advocate of this, drive your comps, like get, put your, put your butt in the car and go lay eyeballs on that, on that, on that asset, right? 
And we've gotten very, very easy and lackadaisical in our research. It's exactly what Jeff was saying earlier. And it's like, we got to get back to the fundamentals of business of putting our butts in the car and laying eyes on this kind of stuff. I'm not just going to sit back and, oh, yeah, this comp is okay or whatever. Go see it. Get a really good feel for it, right? And so am I going to go back six months, nine months or whatever? I think the question to that, it has to do with the price point that the asset is in. I think that obviously we're going to have to you know, be even more conservative, I would think, on this um, upper end market. This lower end market still has a lot of demand. But the problem is, is my understanding is a lot of these folks that are being affected by Corona, I think that, that lower end market, they're going to be affected the most with employment. So there are going to be a fair amount of those people that no longer have the ability to qualify. So it's kind of like, look, I want to be conservative and I do want to be in that medium price point where the majority of transactional activities taking place. But because of the nature of the situation, these guys are no longer um, as well qualified. So at the end of the day, it's going to depend on the price point that I'm in, I think. But I think that rather than doing what, you know, and again, props to the wholesalers, but rather than doing what the wholesalers have been doing on the front end and inflating maybe 10 or 15% and pushing a value, we need to come the other way and we need to probably bring it down, I would say five to 10% for now. And I would do this though too. I'm, so again, I, right now I'm saying five to 10% below of what I'm really thinking that ARV is. And people might go, oh, I'm never going to get any deals. That's okay. Another day, another deal. And you say, oh, are my numbers wrong? No, your numbers aren't wrong. Your seller's just wrong. So I'd come back and I identify that. But we need to make the, I'd make a downward adjustment, 5 to 10%, be a little bit more aggressive as well in my pricing on the back end as well. Use me out. Let's see what we can get. You guys, I feel like the times of saying, hey, let's bump it another 10 or 15 grand and see what we can get. I feel like those days are over. I think you got to, again, come back to what you really think those values are. Bring it down just a hair. Give yourself a little bit more margin there. Um, so that, that that's my thought. We just have to be a little bit more conservative on it. Um, but 5 to 10% is probably, you know, my, my, initial, my initial thought. And again, I'm going to tell you guys, like, I don't have so much ego that I know exactly where this is going. I have, right. I have no clue. That's why we have meetings like this. I will say this, when things got a little crazy in, you know, the 07 type market, our portfolio of holdings, we had, you know, maybe 25 flips at that time. Um, we could feel, you could feel it. Like you can just feel that market start to slide a little bit on these active listings that you put on. You can see how many, you know, showings you're getting and all these offers. And as you feel that market, I'm telling you, rather than chasing this market down, assuming it goes there, I don't know, but rather than chasing this market down, you got to get ahead of that thing. So if it used to be, Hey, you know, I tell folks I, the first 14 days, the first two weekends are the single most important aspect of a listing. I'm going to hit that thing and I'm going to get that feedback and boom, I'm moving ahead of it and I'm going to push people into my property because it's going to be the nicest and the cheapest thing around. So that would be my advice. You know, maybe five to 10% on that front end, drive your comps, really understand the value. And then once it's on the market, don't sit, don't wait. Because you recognize first 14 days, we flushed all, we'd, we'd flush 95% of those buyers through. So we either have to wait till the new buyer enters the market or we have to come back and incentivize one of those 95 percenters to come back and hit us up, you know? So Perfect. I've got to, I've got to get in front of it and make those reductions along the way. Those are great tips. I love that. I love that. Jeff, add to uh, it. Um, yeah. My, my initial gut was uh, I would discount everything 5%, assuming it's going to sell for 5% less than it's been selling for the last three months. Um, I, and then I think reassess in four weeks. Because again, economically, we just don't know. Because right now, the focus is on the virus, not necessarily, you know, which is a temporary phenomenon. And it's just yeah. how is that going to affect the long-term market? And we just need more time. So keep moving forward. Be, be con probably more conservative than you've been. Um, discount 5% for the next month. And if it looks like we are going to hit into a heavier recession, the 5 to 10% mark, I think, is really a good advice. Uh, we saw 10 to 15 percent depreciations in the last cycle, depending on what part of the, the county and state you were in. 
A um, few places I think had close to 20, but that was kind of more rare. So yeah, it's just about getting better numbers and keeping abreast of things. And the market can change week by week. So whatever we're saying today may be outdated in two weeks from now. Yeah. So keep on top of things. Perfect. Great advice. And then just a reminder, this, this group chat seems to be going pretty well here. We're not going to get to everybody's questions, yeah. but take a look and look at it. Some of these guys on here, you know, are better than, 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 than me for sure, or better than uh, uh, people that could be on this call. But so John Maxim, listen to him. Justin Puchar has some really good points. Nate Worthen. I mean, I could list off all of you guys. And, and what I will do is I will summarize the chat when I put it on Facebook. So if, if a question goes unanswered, chime in there and, and let's all give back. So can I uh, another thing on the Lenin, if I can? Yeah, please, please. Um, what I'm seeing, you know, we, the three of us and the other hard money lenders are coming from a part of an institutional hard money lending perspective, but it is rampant right now of investors borrowing friends and family's money absolutely inappropriately. I mean, there are investors pulling 10,000 here, 10,000 there, 10,000 from an aunt and a, and a grandma. And, and if these things blow up, you're now hurting your family. Um, so just be really, really careful who you're borrowing from. There are rules and licensing and regulations too that a lot of people are not understanding, but they're getting, they're borrowing, you know, a hundred percent of everything. They're not putting any skin in the game. There's, there's no cushion in the game because they're borrowing every last dime to get the flip done. And that is, that is a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So be very careful of that. No, perfect. That's great advice. So I want to keep these, even though we could go on forever, I want to keep these to an hour to respect everybody's time and everybody's busy and everybody's got things to chase and do. So one question that came up, I think we can hit on this really quick. I don't have a ton of experience. Um, and uh, Ben, chime in, because I know you've done a lot of development. Chime in on the chat and then we can follow up. But one person asked about development deals. And I myself have two projects, uh, one that with Jared Hall that's on the call, um, development deals that are like, you know, maybe started or you want to start or not start, you know, like what advice would we quickly have for anyone with a development deal? Um, I'll give you my quick opinion. I, I have 10 units in kind of Glendale Rose Park area that we have approved through Salt Lake City. We're actually going to close on the other half of the land today. And we're in a great spot because we have the houses, we haven't torn them down. And I think our approach is going to be a little bit of a wait and see, keep our entitlements where they are and just have options. I think it's going to be harder for people that are midstream, right? Because some of the funding may dry up a little bit, but if, you know, maybe we could look at it, Mike, really quick from the standpoint of development and John Prince, he's going to jump back in. Now, I do want to talk stuff. rentals. Brian Pitcher's talking about some good rental stuff. And I told people we would cover the, yeah, the yeah. buying book people too, not just the flippers, because there's some really good things we need to talk about rentals as well. But so, I want to so hear Mike's development stuff and his re what he's doing on his rentals. Yeah. So we can go real quick on the development because not too many of us are in that. And then jump Reach out to Ben Lake. He's, he's the yeah. dude on the development. Perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, guys. I don't do a lot of big development. I, I, yeah, I don't either. and I haven't over the years. Um, I would just, liquidity is going to be king. If I was going to pull out a 20 unit type deal, maybe I'd find opportunity to, again, cash out on several more up front, not take the whole thing down. Um, again, over the years, that hasn't been my, my, my forte. So I, I, like, I like liquidity and I don't find a lot of liquidity in some of the development deals. So I can't offer an opinion on that that I think would be really significant other than you know liquidity is gonna is gonna be king here and i think your strategy matt to to pause for a moment and just let some of the smoke clear seems like it's 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 good rational thinking right let's so so jump on to rentals people do have a ton of question about rentals if we can hit that real quick for five or ten minutes on um, it's going to be different for everybody. Mike, you have, you have a lot of rentals. Uh, you're probably a little bit nervous about April and May's rents. Any thoughts on what may be coming? Uh, I mean, we, we've already gotten a few phone calls from tenants that are saying, hey, just so you know, I've been laid off and or my hours have been cut back. So um, again, I think communication is, is key there. Um, but again, I, I don't, 
that's why we have reserves, right? That's why you sit and go, hey, we want to have four to six months reserves in some of these accounts, right? So um, we, we preached that before. If you don't have the reserves, you, I don't, you're just going to have to work through some of those some of those tenants case by case, open communication type of a thing um, once again. So, but in the long term, again, we bought them for the cash flow. We're going to hold them for the cash flow. I don't have anything that says, hey, I've got to sell these because I need liquidity or, or whatever. But I mean, that is a nice little, you know, poker chip to have if things get a little bit scarier over here on this transactional real estate side that you have a few of these for liquidity and be able to tap into that. That's fantastic. Um, but I, I would, I would, you know, crystal ball a little bit in you know, moving forward. We're going to, we're going to have some, some tenants that, that fall behind. You know, you're you're going to start getting those calls if you haven't gotten them yet. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Dive yeah, into my, that real quick. Yeah. My, my suggestion to the landlords is the same suggestion to the wholesalers. Remember that your tenants are your customers, right? And we're in a business and, you know, at the, the law firm, you know, I, I get the sort of the business customer relationship because it's such a traditional brick and mortar kind of business. But, you know, in real estate, when we're passing deals to other like wholesalers, to their final buyers or landlords to the tenants, we forget that these are actually our customers, right? And Tony Robbins, you know, make raving fans out of your customers, okay? So work, my suggestion is absolutely another amen on the reserves. You should have had them already. If not, start stockpiling a good six, even 12 months reserves on rentals. Um, that will save your life. Um, work with tenants. Feel free to uh, confirm if they've been laid off. Feel free to confirm now. You don't have to just accept their word. You, you uh, vetted them when you uh, first got them in and you check their employment history. Check their employment and work with them. If you want to uh, maybe reduce rent. If, they're, if they got laid off two of the weeks of this, this month and they can only make half a rent, accept half rent, right? Yeah. That's totally fine. Um, maybe uh, give them a, a month break on rent. And kind of, I was thinking about this yesterday because I had this conversation with um, a client who has a lot of rentals. We were talking about different options and ways to work with, with tenants. And it's, it, if you kick them out, you're going to be empty anyways. You're going to miss uh, you know, some rent payments just in the natural process of getting new tenants in, and you may not get as good a tenants as you had. So if you had good tenants, you want to keep your good tenants. Yeah. Okay? They're in trouble. It's not their fault, right? They're, they're not trying to hose you. Right. They're stuck in this just like we're stuck in this. Be flexible, work with them. And to that end, you know, so my client said, well, what if I do want to, you know, give him half rent for a couple of months? And so what I did yesterday, and these are now all available on, my website is I put together some free legal documents. One of them is a temporary, temporary lease modification. You have to remember that your words and action can actually rewrite written documents. So if you, if you give them, you know, say, okay, fine, I'll cut your rent in half this month and next month, you could actually establish precedence that that's now the new rent payment and they can hold you to that lower rent. So this temporary modification of lease allows you to clearly define, say, hey, during this time period, you know, I'm going to cut your rate for by $300 for the next three months, but then on July 1st, it goes back to its original um, rate. That way you're right. very clear with them. You're setting expectations. They're not going to get a free ride right forever because you can't manage that. But you, you're showing them that you're flexible and can work with them and you're going to help them through this. Um, and that's going to make them very loyal to you and, and make it clear and in writing so that there's no disagreement or problems later, especially if you have to go down and evict, being able to recoup, uh, you know, the back rent through, through that as well. And so that's on the website, free form, go ahead. I've also got two corporate succession documents. One is a transfer on death and I don't want to get all alarmist. But I got a lot of clients asking, you know, what happens to all my entities, my LLCs, my assets and everything if something happens to me and I can't either, either I passed away and I don't, you know, what happens then? And what happens if I can't manage the rental? What if I get sick and I can't manage my rental properties? Who do I have take over? So I've got a temporary appointment of manager form where you can, that is triggered by certain events so that you can maintain your business operations if something happens to you. And 
uh, transfer on death, it allows you to cover what happens to these assets and that your membership in these LLCs if something were to happen to you. And awesome. those are free on the website, just REI Master Use slash, and then the legal page, you'll find them right there. So while, thanks Jeff, that was awesome. And you're getting good feedback on those links. I'm gonna post them. Um, I'm gonna post them on my Facebook page and then I will also email them out so people have them. Jeff, why don't you go ahead and in the chat, quickly give everyone your, your um, resource page again so we have it. And then, uh, man, we could go on for hours. And if you guys are still liking these, we'll do it again next week and I'll post a new time. Like I said, I, I wanna be respectful to the hour. And so I will repost this video. A lot of questions we didn't get answered, but that's okay. Everybody engage. And if you don't know someone that's on this call, this is a great chance to get to know them. Right. You know, I will send out who's who, kind of like we do at the RIAs, where you kind of send out like a, uh, a sheet of everyone's contact information here. Everybody's here is going to be a resource to everybody else. And so I get jazzed up. I've learned a ton. And this is so beneficial to me. And so thank you all for being on it. Um, we're going to end for right now, if we can, Mike, give me your, you know, your last minute and a half for this call for this day to end this week, you know, give us, give us your, your parting wisdoms that aren't going to go away. Cause like Mike said, everybody go follow Mike on his Facebook page, the smarter tribe. He has a ton of value and uh, so does Jeff. So we'll go Mike, then Jeff, and then I'll quickly close it and we'll keep crushing the day. First of all, Matt, thanks for having me on. Jeff, awesome. I've got a couple notes um, here, so thanks for. His, I hope to connect with you soon, Jeff. Um, my my first thoughts are, guys, just just consider the voices that are coming into your life right now, because there is so much being spewed. I think half of this battle right now is going to put a strong filter on it, and so that that's my first that's my first thing. Um, there are some gurus out there right now that are saying some things that I'm, I, I just, I can't agree with. And there's a lot of big voices yelling a lot of things. I think prudence, conservancy, taking care of your, you know, taking care of business. I do think there's opportunity as it relates to all this as well, as it relates to our, our marketing and possibly doubling down on some of this marketing, there's a lot. Of, I mean, you yourself have asked the question, hey, maybe I should sell, maybe I should do something different. That same psychology is happening out there in the general public. I think you have opportunity to be a good, strong solution for people. We're problem solving. That's, that's how we're, they're, we're minded on that. If we can be properly problem minded, you know, individuals and have that mentality. There's opportunity there. So listen to the, the right people. This is part of that. Um, and again, I would look back into your notes right now, just as I mentioned earlier, circle the one thing, because there's going to be another call or another chat or another meeting, and you're going to forget half of this stuff. And, and the gold is actually already right here. Um, if there's one thing that I want to offer, it's what Jeff said, having a second strategy, knowing that the type of asset is the right type of asset that gives me the ability for a second or a third option. That's what, that's what I want to have in my portfolio right now. So uh, that's my thought. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Jeff, parting thoughts. Yeah, I guess first some housekeeping, you know, the Saluria luncheon for April, I'll just keep you posted whether we actually have it in person at the restaurant or whether I do it again by webinar, just I'll keep you posted on that. Um, I'm also, and, and Andrea has been calling um, pretty much our entire client list, but since you're on this, I'm doing a 10 to 15 minute free strategy session with any client of mine, uh, just to kind of, if you've got specific questions about maybe something's going on with your business entities or your business plan, uh, your, your family, et cetera, happy to talk to, to you one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a 15 minute call, just give the office a call at 801-560-2180. Don't do it right now. Give Andrea a break. But give us a call. I'm happy to set up 15 minutes with you. Um, and as far as, you know, parting advice, yes, just Mike, I, again, amen to Mike. Just uh, take care of your family first, above all. That is the most important thing is your family. Make sure your family is going to be okay. Second, make sure your businesses are going to be okay. Um, make sure your health is going to be okay. Don't forget that. When we 
pull a lot of negative stuff into us, it actually de decreases our immune system and we're much likely to, to get sick. Even just regular colds or just run down or just lethargic, right? We don't have that energy to keep doing what we wanna do. It's because of all the negativity we're putting into ourselves. So keep your health uh, going um, and just let me know if you need anything. I'm, I'm absolutely here to help people through this. I lived through two of these. You're going to make it. I, I'm still here. I, I, I did love not it. die. I did not pass away. I did not collapse. I did. I, you know, in, the, in 2008, I did take some of my rentals and I sold the seller financing, right? Perfect. I didn't have the buffer that I needed, but I knew people who had answers. I've kind of joked, and sometimes I say that I'm the most intelligent person in the world. It is tongue in cheek. It is funny. But I have often said, yes, I know everything. Not because I know everything, but I know people who do. Do, yeah. Go to those people and, you know, there's always somebody that knows more than you. There's people that know far more than me on a lot of topics. I get questions. I'm like, I don't know. But I'll find <laughs> and then, out. But I will find out for you. Awesome. I will go to people who do know and find out. Okay, you guys, those are awesome thoughts. My quick last parting comments. Uh, one thought I had that I wrote down that I want to share is, even though it's an anxious time, we're unsure, we tend to be going through worst case scenarios or like, oh, poor me, or why did this have to happen? You know, we're all dealt the same cards and we're gonna deal with them differently. Let's reinforce that dealing with positivity, look for the light, look for the opportunities, look for the ability to develop new skills and capabilities. This is the perfect time to do all of that. And then the other thing is, is man, we live in, you know, we're still one percenters of the world. Like our worst days are still so much better than the best days for a lot of people. So let's remember that. And uh, let's just remember to keep giving, keep collaborating and all that kind of stuff. And so I will post, send me a direct message for any feedback you guys have. I'm, I'm happy to keep doing these. I like them. Um, don't really have a great plan here as to the flow and protocol for next week, but I, I think people want to see this again. So we'll do it. Have a great day if we can help in any way. Mike, thank you so much. Jeff, thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks Mike. Hey, guys. Have a great day. Thanks. See you.